Hello everyone. Today I want to talk to you about inference to the best explanation. So here's the roadmap. What is the inference to the best explanation? I want to introduce some terminologies that we want to know. How do we evaluate inference to the best explanation? And we want to consider an example. Inference to the best explanation is a form of inductive reasoning in which we reason from premises about a state of affairs to an explanation for that state of affairs. Notice that inference to the best explanation is a form of inductive reasoning, not deductive reasoning. So here are some terms that you want to know. Explanen is that which does the explaining. So the terms explanations, theories are synonymous to the explanen. So I'm going to use these three terms uh, interchangeably. Explanendum uh, is that which needs to be explained. So I'm going to use words like state, affair, state of affairs phenomenon and explanandum interchangeably. So let's consider an example to illustrate uh, the inference to the best explanation. So suppose that you wake up in the morning and you find out that your car doesn't start. I mean, it's a puzzling phenomenon. What are some explanations, explanations? Well, maybe the battery is dead or maybe the fuel tank is empty. And if I ask you, you know, what are possible um, explanations, you might say, well, one or two, or it could be three or four, or maybe it could be five, uh, you know, that poltergeist. Uh, but, but given uh, this phenomenon, uh, probably one or two are the best explanations to explain the fact that the car does not start. So how do we evaluate inference to the best explanation? Well, luckily we have the test formula. There are four steps to using the test formula. Step one, you state the theory and you check for its consistency. Step four, uh, I'm sorry, step two, you assess the evidence for the theory. Step three, you scrutinize alternative theories, and step four, you test the theories with the criteria of adequacy. So let me talk about step one and step four in a little more detail in, uh, in subsequent slides. But the steps two and three are familiar to us, right? Whenever somebody states a theory to explain something, then you want to ask, why is that true? In other words, show me the evidence, right? And you want to assess the evidence for the theory. Now, step three is that you want to not only assess the evidence for the theory that you prefer, but you want to scrutinize alternative theories that could either confirm or perhaps cast a doubt on the theory that you are proposing. Okay, so let's talk about step one. So consistency, consistency is a requirement of rationality. In order to be a rational thinker, your beliefs and ideas and theories have to be consistent. Now there are two ways that a theory can or may not be consistent. Uh, the first thing is an in internally consistent theory is free of logical contradictions and an externally consistent theory is consistent with the data that it is explaining. So a minimal requirement before you move on to steps two, three, or four is that, uh, you, is that you want to ask whether a theory that you're entertaining is consistent. If it is, you may move on to steps through two, three, and four. If it's not, uh, you can say, well, you know, end of the story. Now, step four is that you want to test the theory uh, with the criteria of adequacy. And the criteria of adequacy, there are five, uh, testability, fruitfulness, scope, 
simplicity and conservatism. So let me talk about these uh, in some detail. So testability. Uh, when you are entertaining a theory, you want to know whether there is some way to determine in principle if a theory is true. Now, some theories are quite easy to test to see whether it is true or not. But other theories may not be so easy. Uh, maybe uh, there is no method or no means by which we can test a theory. But that's okay. But the question is, can we test a theory in principle? Now, some theories are, some theories aren't. So we have to think about that carefully. The next criterion is fruitfulness. And that has to do with the number of novel predictions that a theory can make. Now, um, ideally, we want a theory to be able to make predictions. And a theory that can make novel predictions uh, or a greater number of novel predictions is a more fruitful theory and a better theory. A theory that cannot make a novel prediction does not mean necessarily that it is a bad theory, but it's less fruitful and less useful theory. Now, scope has to do with the number of diverse phenomena that a theory can explain. Ideally, a good theory is the one that can explain not only the phenomenon that you are trying to explain, but other phenomenon, phenomena as well. So you can imagine a theory that can only explain what you're trying to explain, but, you but also you can have a theory that can explain what you're trying to explain, but other phenomena as well. Simplicity means the number of assumptions made by a theory. Now, generally speaking, a theory that makes the least amount of assumptions is a more simple theory and a better theory. Now, the word simplicity there does not connote uh, easy or simple. That's not what it means. What it means is that it does not multiply unnecessary assumptions made by a theory. Now, there is a principle called Occam's razor. Occam, William of Occam was a medieval philosopher and scientist, and he put forth a, a principle that's widely accepted and used in science and philosophy. In the, in the, so the Occam's razor says this, the simplest explanation is often the best one, meaning that a theory that does not multiply unnecessary assumptions to explain something is a simple theory and it is a better theory. Conservatism means how well a theory fits with existing knowledge. Now, you can imagine uh, there is a, a tremendous amount of knowledge uh, that, that the human beings have accumulated uh, throughout history, right? So a theory, a conservative theory, is the one that fits well with existing knowledge out there. And a less conservative theory is a theory that does not uh, cohere or fit with existing knowledge. Now, the word conservatism, conservatism um, does not imply conservatism in politics. We're not talking about that. Now that we know what the, the inference to the best explanation is and how to use the test formula, let's apply those lessons. Uh, one way that we can do this is to consider two case studies at the end of chapter 10. There, uh, there two, the two case studies are a doomed flight and an amazing cure. Now, the doomed flight has to do with the story of Flight 200 exploding midair. There are five explanations, as you can see below. Now, what the textbook does is to uh, present each explanation test each explanation and check for both internal and external consistency and assess the evidence and encounter evidence 
for each explanation. So you can read the textbook and then kind of fill in the details about, uh, about how to do that. So for instance, number one, maybe uh, Flight 200 exploded because there was a terrorist missile fire. And then, and then you can see how we can check for its consistency and, and to evaluate the evidence provided, right? And then, um, and then after you've done that, you want to also check each theory uh, um, and check for uh, the criteria of adequacy, right? So I have laid out five theories, right? Theory one, two, uh, three, four, and five. And then these are the, uh, the criteria of adequacy. And then how we can assess um, whether a theory meets these criteria. So for instance, right, theory one meets the testability, scope, fruitfulness, and simplicity, uh, but it does not meet with the, the conservatism, and so on and so forth. Um, so you might want to go back to the case study to see if you can figure out how we, can, we may apply the criteria of adequacy to the case study. Now, the second case study is called an amazing cure. And an amazing cure has to do with this phenomenon of people taking homeopathic remedies and they seem to get better, right? I mean, so, so if you see someone or perhaps you take homeopathic remedies and then you get better as a result of taking that, then you want to know did that actually work, right? Okay, so the two explanations are homeopathy on the one hand and then the placebo effect on the other hand. Now the homeopathy is, uh, is extremely, extremely dilute solutions of substances that produce symptoms in a healthy person that can cure the same symptoms in a sick person. Now that's one explanation of why people get better. But another explanation or theory, an alternative theory that's available to us is the placebo effect, right? So people taking homeopathic remedies feel better, not because of the homeopathic remedies and it's, um, you know, whether it works or not, but because of the uh, placebo effect, right? So those are the two explanations. Now, and you, can, you can read the textbook to see how uh, the author, uh, um, you know, test each theory, each theory's consistency, and then the evidence and the counter evidence to validate um, each theory. And then the second thing, now the next thing you want to do is to test each theory against the criteria of adequacy. And you do that for homeopathy, and you also do it for the placebo effect.